I recently run a half marathon here in Ottawa, so I take my hat off to anyone who can run further than that. And I cannot imagine what it takes to run an ultra marathon in a desert. Ugh. But Dion Leonard is an Australian British endurance athlete who set out to do just that, running 155 miles in the Gobi Desert. And what he didn't count on was his athletic focus being distracted by a scruffy little homeless dog he found on the way. He tried to ignore her and failed miserably. And on today's show, we share with you the incredible story of a little stray dog that refused to be left behind. Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. And I'm Claire Mansell in Ottawa, Canada. Welcome to Dog Edition. Where voices from around the world consider all things dog. Dog Edition is the first show designed for you to listen to as you walk your dogs. So Claire, as you said, you are a marathon or a half marathon. <laughs> half marathon. Which is way more running than I ever do. Yeah, and it's such a shame. We've said this before that a half marathon is, it's like a half thing. It should be a whole thing. It should be like a 21K instead of just a half marathon. <laughs> but I tell you, it's anyone who runs and anyone who does any distance, they always say that everyone has their Everest. And running an ultra marathon is such an extreme thing. But Dion Leonard set out to do just that and to run it in desert conditions I can't even imagine. That and more. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's take a walk. Because we've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey Pepper, want to go for a walk? The story you're about to hear is an incredible story. It is a story about this dog in the Gobi Desert it's extraordinary, and it is brought to you through our 101 Dog Stories contest. This is one of our winning submissions. It was submitted by Saskia Edwards, and she takes us on a journey to the Gobi Desert and introduces us to this ultra marathoner and this wonderful dog. Dion Leonard is an ultra marathon runner. Ultra marathons are not like regular marathons. For one thing, they can be a lot longer, and often held in extreme places and conditions. They test people psychologically, physically, and frankly emotionally. A few years ago, Dion was about to start one of these intense races in the desert in China. The Gobi Desert in China was where this race was, and one of the hottest and windiest and driest locations known to man. The race is 250 kilometer race. You know, it goes for a whole week. You have to carry all of your food and kit to survive the week as well. It was going to be rough, but what Dion didn't realize at the time was that this was to be the beginning of a much bigger test of his endurance in a totally different way. It started with a little dog who seemed to appear out of nowhere following and bothering Dion on day two of the race. It's about 100 runners at the race and uh, we were about to set off and run off for the day of running 25 miles, so about 42 kilometres. It was chewing on my shoes. She was chewing on specifically the gaiters that keep the sand out of your shoes. I sort of flicked her off with my foot and told her to go away. She jumped back onto my shoes and she started chewing on the sand gaiters again. Seeing this dog keeping chewing on my shoes was a little bit annoying so <laughs> the race started and everyone's running down the trail and here I am with this damn dog on my leg and I'm trying <laughs> to run down the trail and I can't get rid of her. Could you describe how she looked when you first saw her? She was in a pretty pretty bad condition. She, I mean she was a young dog. She had really bad skin. Her hair on the back of her coat was really really wiry. You know you could tell she'd had a really tough life but there's something about her, like she was a sweet dog. She was always very friendly with people. She trusted people. 
but who knows where she came from, what she was doing out there, what she was living on, what she was eating, etc. We think she's a mix between Chihuahua and Shih Tzu, which is very, very common for that part of northwest China. Very short legs, very big brown eyes, and she's got this really weird curly tail as well, and she's a really <laughs> unique looking dog. This dog didn't appear to have an owner and followed Dion all day. She actually ran the whole 25 miles that day behind me or at the time she'd run ahead of me. Yeah, for the whole day she was there, but I never spoke to her. I never gave her any of my food. I remember cr- crossing the finish line that day. They were sort of clapping and cheering and playing the drums and I thought, this is really weird. Why are they, why are they <laughs> doing that for me? And uh, it wasn't until I'd crossed the finish line and I looked behind me and they were still clapping and cheering and playing the drums that it was for the little dog running in behind me. (laughs) But it was at that moment because, you know, I'm such a competitive person when I go to these races. As I finished and I saw what she'd done and I just, it sort of hit me that I hadn't spoken to her, I hadn't given her any food and she collapsed in the tent next to me and I started to look after her. And Dion even gave her a name, Gobi, after the desert where she was found. She slept in Dion's tent that night. It's kind of cool, little dog had slept next to me. She smelt really bad and... uh, (laughs) I still wasn't thinking very much of it until day three. Day three was where things between Gobi and Dion changed. This leg of the race was about another 25 miles and included a river crossing with deep water and ferocious currents. They were really strong currents and it could sort of push you away, it could drag you away if you sort of weren't really strong-footed. And as I was walking through the one of the river crossings, I was getting across to about halfway when I could hear this barking and yelping and whining behind me and it sort of stopped me in my tracks. And I turned around to see this dog running up and down the riverbank and she was panicking and she was worried that I'd left it there, which of course I had because I was running a race. You know, first and second mm. runners were ahead of me in the race and... Yeah, all of this commotion happened behind me and it, it, it did stop me in my tracks because I wasn't sure what was happening to the dog. And if she'd have tried crossing the water, you know, she would have been washed away. I made this split decision to go back and pick her up. And as I knelt down to pick her up, she looked at me with sort of trust and a bit of sort of love in her eyes. And I picked her up and I sort of held her a little bit away from me, just hoping she wouldn't bite me. But as I sort of held her, she sort of made her way into my sort of chest and into my arms and the next thing she's looking up at me with these big brown eyes and it was the real moment where I could see this love in her eyes and I just felt this massive connection to her and yeah I I can't explain what happened in that moment but that was a moment that would change both our lives forever. Dion jeopardized his chances of winning the race to help the dog Gobi managed to keep running, except on days when it was too hot. Yeah, Gobi's a very fast dog. She's (laughs) capable of running much quicker than I am. And those four legs, like, they could motor through the desert. It made running the desert a lot easier for me because it put a smile on my face to see the fun she was having out there. When did you realise, okay, this dog has to come home with me? Yeah, we had so many moments out there that just made me realise that I needed to bring Gobi home and give her a better life. So I made her that promise out in the desert to to do that. And having a very difficult, destructive, uh, depressive and abusive upbringing myself and leaving home at the age of 13, I sort of felt a little bit of myself in Gobi. So I wanted to give her a better life and be the person, I guess, that I wanted to have around me when I was younger. Dion's childhood was tough. He was homeless like Gobi too. I lived in someone's shed, I've lived under bridges, I've lived in hotels, caravans, hostels, pretty terrible conditions just to try and put myself through school and not knowing where food was going to come from one day to the next and having to go out and find a job at the age of 13. It's made me sort of a very vulnerable person growing up and something that I realised Gobi was also very vulnerable in the desert as well and that she had nothing and nobody out there to look after her. It was a simple Mm -hmm. thing for me to be able to do to to sort of make the promise and then I had to sort of stick through it and make sure that uh, we got Gobi home. It was a simple promise to make, but getting Gobi home would be anything but simple. Dion had to return home to Scotland. He already had a flight booked, but Gobi couldn't come with him yet. 
She needed to get a bunch of vaccinations and paperwork before she could travel. But a volunteer said they'd look after her in China. She was being looked after in a city called Urumqi, a city of three million people. Dion started a crowdfunding campaign, he started getting media attention, and he actually raised all the money he needed to get Gobi to the UK. But then he got a call. And I received a phone call to say that she'd gone missing, and of course I was you know, devastated and heartbroken to hear that she'd missing in that big city of three million people as well. Gobi had run away. She'd gone missing. That was really the first sort of moment that I had to sort of test my commitment and promise to Gobi of, you know, bringing her home. Mm. So when did you decide that you'd personally go and try and find her? Well, I had to speak to my employers to say, look, uh, you remember that story <laughs> of me and the dog? And well, unfortunately, she's gone missing now. And uh, they were great. They gave me a blessing to go out there and to, to look for her. So Dion took several flights and travelled thousands of miles back to China. Not knowing the language, not knowing anyone, and setting up a search and volunteer team was certainly pretty overwhelming. But that's what oh, yeah. I sort of set out to do and to make sure that I at least tried my best to try and find her, which I thought was probably really a needle in a haystack. What kind of help did you start to get or how did the search go? So I started off with one lady and she would help me putting up these posters of uh, Gobi being missing. And it also had a reward amount of money on there for anyone that found Gobi. They would get 10,000 Chinese dollars as well. So it was sort of creating a little bit of uh, awareness around the streets. And it was then that social media started to pick up in China on the story and how I'd traveled all of this way for this uh, little dog. They thought it was really amazing. And then the press started to pick up on it. And Whilst all this was happening, more and more and more volunteers started to come out and to help. And suddenly we had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers searching wow. day and night for Gobi. Yeah, it was incredible. It, was, it really was amazing. All these people coming together, looking for Gobi, it was amazing. But with all the hype, things took an unexpected turn. There was a lot of pressure on, on myself to, to find Gobi and we had mm. to just keep searching and keep looking. And, and one of the things that happened was we had that, 10,000 Chinese dollars, it's equivalent to three months salary for someone in that area. So yeah. a bit of a negative as well, because we had yeah. a lot of bad people coming out of the uh, out of the woodworks trying to tell me that they had Gobi, they wanted more money, they were going to kill Gobi if I didn't give them oh more God. money. They would, we would have phone calls from people saying, we've got your dog and I'd go around to their home and, you know, to be a Labrador. And I'd say, that that's, this isn't the dog, is it? And they're like, no. Then it got downright scary. The story gained so much news media, social media popularity that the Chinese government started to also message us to say, look, we're happy with everything that's going on, but if this turns sour or if things go wrong or if Dion starts to say negative things to the press, then we're going to shut down the search and I'd be, wow. you know, kicked out of the country straight away. So this turned into a way more complicated and stressful search than you first anticipated. At any point, did you sort of give up hope and think, this is too complicated and difficult, I need to just give this search up? The search was spiralling out of control. I was becoming very depressed about the state of where we were going with the search and the likelihood that we wouldn't find Gobi. It was certainly a very, very difficult period and something that I wouldn't ever want to have to go through again. Dion was really about to throw in the towel, give it all up, but then he got a message. It was actually late one evening and we received a message to say, someone's just sent a photo of this dog and they think it's Gobi. And it was a father and son who were walking through a park and they noticed this little dog between the bushes and looking sort of thirsty and hungry and they thought ah, I think that's the dog that's in the that's been missing that everyone's talking about and we'll send a picture over and we'll see if it's the dog when we received the picture I wasn't so sure it was Gobi and uh, the picture wasn't great and she, the dog that was in the picture had this wound on its head hesitantly Dion and some volunteers made a one-hour drive to see the dog. By the time we got there, I was pretty tired and 
pretty much over it all. And I remember walking up into the home thinking, this isn't going to be it. This is going to be another shakedown for money, another problem. As I walked into the house, I walked in behind the translator, the driver. So I was the last person to walk in and I hadn't said a word. And across the other side of the lounge room was this little dog. And it came running towards me and it was barking and yelping and whining, just like the dog along the river that day and it jumped mm. up into my arms and I realised straight away it was Gobi. And how did you feel? Oh, I was in tears. I was like uh, amazed, uh, overwhelmed, overjoyed. I, I could not believe it. Everyone else around me just kept saying, is that Gobi? Is that Gobi? I was like, yes, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just couldn't believe it. Gobi was injured but alive. Dion decided to stay in China this time to organise the paperwork for Gobi to travel. And then finally, they boarded the flight from China to Europe. Gobi actually flew next to me in a little <laughs> bag and, you know, a little carry-on bag. So she sat next to me in the plane. You know, as we drove down the street in, in Edinburgh where we, where we live, like people in the street sort of clapping and cheering. And then, of course, we had a little party at our place as well. So it was the first time I probably thought about it for six months that I'd been away, we'd actually made this happen and it had finally come to fruition that we'd brought Gobi home. Gobi settled into Scottish life. The weather is quite different from the desert, though. She got used to the cat and becoming a dog celebrity. She has an Instagram, at Finding Gobi, and Dion wrote a book called Finding Gobi, A Little Dog with a Very Big Heart. And it's even looking like it's going to be turned into a movie. Not bad for a stray desert dog. If you'd have told me as a 13-year-old boy when I left home with nothing that I'd have this amazing story and Gobi as a stray desert dog would also leave the Gobi Desert and have this amazing story as well, it's, um, it's pretty incredible to think where life can take you. Life is full of surprises. I would never have ever have guessed that I would have, you know, foregone winning a race for a little dog that I didn't know. But, you know, at the end of the day, the race was irrelevant and... I guess I won Gobi in the end, and that was <laughs> that was pretty cool as well. Good consolation prize. Absolutely the best, and I wouldn't I wouldn't change it for any award or any medal. That's for sure. Dion Leonard, for Dog Edition. I'm Saskia Edwards in Mexico City, Mexico. I love that story. That is so touching and and, and really reminds all us dog lovers the connection that we have to our dogs and the sacrifices we would make. Have you ever lost a dog for even a short period of time, Jim? Yes. And it's it's so frightening, isn't it? There's roads and there's people who can steal them. And, you know, the thought of being the other side of the world Mm. and having to get on a plane to get to the place where the dog is lost, and then start a search and party. And wrangle with the bureaucracy in yes. China. Yes, yeah. and the language difference, and and not knowing where you would start because the dog disappeared from one location, but by the time you arrive there, then it's been several days or whatever, and you, so where do you look for a small dog in a big city? Dog lovers will do anything for their dog. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, an update on what Gobi and Dion have been up to. We'll be right back. And now, a message from your dog. Every day with you is like a day at the beach. And I want as many beach days as possible. I want to run and sniff and find a good stick to carry. I want to roll in the grass and warm my belly in the sun. I want to walk with you, run with you, sleep with you, eat with you. And when I eat with you, I want Everpuff. The green, grassy, beef liver spike smell wakes my senses. You may not realize this, but it tastes like homemade gravy especially when you wet it. It infuses any food you give me with health and life and vibrancy. I can feel it, Everpuff, traveling to every cell in my body, nourishing each one. It helps me feel like I'm on top of the world. I'm so glad you're giving it to me every day because every day I'm so glad to be with you. I wouldn't have it any other way. I want my Everpuff. It just makes me feel good. I am so grateful to be your dog and for the Everpup you give me. So now that you know what your dog wants, get Everpup, the ultimate dog supplement. 
Everpup is available in select pet shops and on Amazon. But to get the best price possible, join the Everpup Club at everpupclub.com, where you'll get your first jar for just $8 with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Go to everpupclub.com and use the discount code DPN. That is everpupclub.com. Everpup, every day. Welcome back. Since that fateful race with Gobi in 2016, Dion has kept on running and fortunately keeping Gobi safe at home. They surely train together, however. He's been in a ton of races. You know, in 2016 was was the Gobi Desert race. And then in 2017, he did something in Peru. And then in 2018 in Taiwan. And then the Triple Crown he did in the Mojave Desert because he likes deserts. And then wow. 2019, Dion was the first male to complete the Grand Slam, which again, I'm not a runner, but uh, Claire, you can I, you can tell people what a, the Grand Slam is. It's four a hundred kilometer races, so it's it's a lot. And he also did the Lebman series, which I believe is doing a series of fifty kilometer races in a two month period as well. I mean, I, I can't imagine how exhausting that would be. And, and then 2021, last year, he did something called Bad Water. He's just extraordinary and just mm. keeps running. And that dog isn't running with him, but is his inspiration, is his best pal. Yeah, and has become a little celebrity in herself. And they've got a whole other sideline with sort of, you know, doing speaking events and turning up to awards and Gobi comes along too and does presentations. And they did um, a thing in the UK, which you might not be familiar with, which is the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Or hang on, should I say the Duke of Edinburgh isn't that how you say it? <laughs> you say? That'd be a New Yorker, yeah. The, one of the bureaus of New York. Now, I, I don't know. I, we're not familiar. At least this Yank is not familiar with the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. What what is that? It's kind of a rite of passage for teenagers and mm -hmm. young adults in the UK. And you do all these things where you sort of do some community service, and you also do camping, and you sort of just develop your skills to become a sort of rounded individual. And then you get mm. bronze, silver, gold, and then you're supposed to go into the workplace and it's like, oh, I'm a rounded individual. You can employ me now, <laughs> in theory. And how was Gobi involved in that? Oh, he went along in 2017 with Dion to present some of these awards at Holyrood Palace alongside Prince Edward. Because when you get to like the top level, I think you get a member of the royal family who presents the gold award to you. So you have to work your way up. I might rather have a dog presented. That is so <laughs> very cool. Absolutely. And um, also in September 2019, um, Dion was invited by the president of Slovenia to the Open Gala Day to speak to invited guests about his story of finding Gobi. So this story has really latched into something on an international level that everybody has been able to connect with this story. I love it. I do too. The, the books that Saskia mentioned he's written, they, they've expanded. So they're not just books for adults to read now, they're books for children. And of course, Gobi continues to have his own Instagram account that has blossomed. We checked before we taped this 41,000 followers to date. And there's some pretty interesting images. Yeah, they've been visiting places in New Mexico and Arizona. So Gobi has been able to do some of the traveling, at least, with Dion as well, and seems to be enjoying it, looking healthy and happy and engaged in the photos. If you want to take a look at what Gobi looks like today, we will put a link in the show notes. And if you want to see Gobi perhaps on the big screen, as Saskia talked about, there is some movement on that movie front. In February of last year, Sony Pictures, and Tencent Films purchased the rights from Fox Searchlight, I think, to make the movie based on the journey. And uh, <clears throat> we don't have any news about that yet. But when we do, we will share that with you. I can so imagine that scene on the river with the dog <laughs> running alongside and barking and like, save me, save me, take me with you. I can see that as a movie completely. I can too. This is definitely going to be on the golden screen. And if, I don't know, if, if Sony Pictures can't do it, maybe uh, the Mighty Dog Podcast Network will get into the film production business because this is so perfect. Well, that is all we have time for on today's episode of Dog Edition. I want to thank you for joining us and bringing Dog Edition with you along in your walk. 
We'll be back soon with another episode of Dog Edition, but chances are that you and your dog will be taking a walk between now and then, and so we have some other things for you to listen to. Yes, if you're interested in hearing more from some of our guests, then please check out our DPN sister show, The Long Leash, for Jim's extended conversations. If you enjoyed today's Dog Edition, make sure to follow Dog Edition in your favourite podcast app so that you can take us along on your walk next time and get an instant download of our latest episode and also if you're out on that dog walk and you enjoyed our show i know i always say it but hey if you can mention it to one of your fellow dog lovers it helps our show grow and helps us bring you more dog stories in saskia edwards story saskia was a winner of our 101 dog stories contest and there are still more winners available and you could be one because we are looking for more stories from content creators so if you are a reporter or a podcaster or a youtuber or any type of creator who can tell an audio story like this well then please enter it and you can win perhaps five thousand dollars which is our grand prize we have over fifteen thousand dollars in prize money available all the details are on the website, dogpodcastnetwork.com slash 101. Well, that is it. I'm James Jacobson in Maui, Hawaii. I'm Claire Mansell in Ottawa, Canada. From all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. <laughs>